Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. It's been a good discussion, and I've had the opportunity to continue to look at this bill, and I came across Article 3 of the bill, which is titled Explore Minnesota. And I was looking at some of the language in the bill. I see a section titled Explore Minnesota Tourism, and it reads, Explore Minnesota Tourism is a division of Explore Minnesota and exists to support Minnesota's economy through the promotion and facilitation of travel to and within the state of Minnesota. But then it goes on, and it includes a section, Explore Minnesota for Business, and it says, Explore Minnesota for Business is a division of Explore Minnesota. Its mission is to promote the overall livability and workforce and economic opportunity in Minnesota. Explore Minnesota for Business works in conjunction with the Department of Employment and Economic Development to establish and meet statewide goals in these areas. So it is a statewide goal to promote livability and workforce and economic opportunity in Minnesota, something I definitely agree with. Then at the bottom of this page, it says mission. Promote overall livability and promote workforce and economic opportunity in Minnesota. It is the further mission of Explore Minnesota that the office is advised by councils focused on tourism and talent attraction and business marketing. Well, Mr. President, this bill does the opposite of that. This bill is schizophrenic. I'm looking at a couple of headlines here that are months old, if not weeks old. One of them here, Star Tribune, Minnesota's population growth sees concerning stall for a second year. This is in December. In March of this year, March 30th, the Star Tribune says, Hennepin and Ramsey counties lose population again. So people that are in the state already are fleeing the metro area, and people that are in the state, on the state level, are fleeing Minnesota. For a second year in a row, population stall. Here's another article. Many senior women fight to stay above Minnesota's poverty line. Why are, why are people fleeing? Why are people struggling to live? Because we are making Minnesota, when I say we, I mean the Democrat-led legislature and governor are making Minnesota a very expensive place to have a job, to do business, to live or visit. Here's a headline, April 1st this year, Democrats consider tax and fee increases. I, Mr. President, would absolutely not want to be one of those tasked with promoting the business or trying to attract business talent to Minnesota. It is going to be a monumental, if not impossible, task, given the destructive policies that the Democrats are thrusting across Minnesota. Here's another headline. March 10th, look from Star Tribune, looking for an affordable starter home in the Twin Cities area? Good luck. Why is that? Because of garbage policies such as mandating electric charging stations in small businesses or mandating other codes that are going to increase the cost of construction, which get passed along to increased rent, increased mortgages, and other expenses. It is unbelievable the schizophrenia of this bill. Here's another headline. This is from March 2nd. Not one student profess proficient in math in 10 Minneapolis and St. Paul schools. How do you attract business talent of high paid professionals who would want to send their children to schools that are failing? It is not going to happen. Here's another headline. I already read this one tonight, April 12th. Year to date auto thefts have more than doubled. Who in their right mind is going to want to come to Minnesota 
when crime is skyrocketing. It is unbelievable what Democrats are doing to destroy this state and the absolute tone deaf, tone deaf manner in which they are moving forward with these bills that are destroying businesses, destroying the ability for hardworking people to have an income. Then I see this. It was drawn to my attention. There was a marketing firm here who did an analysis of the 50 states. And they looked at multiple metrics, basic business costs, labor costs, worker availability, cost of space and utilities, healthy business environment, among others. And guess what their analysis found? <laughs> Mr. President, who would you think of the 50 states, which of the states would be the friendliest to start a business? Well, it's not Minnesota. Nevada is the least expensive state in which to start a business. Well, Mr. President, if that's the one end of the spectrum, which state possibly would be in the worst place to start a business? Any guesses? Starts with an M, ends with an A, and rhymes with, I have no idea what Minnesota rhymes with at one in the morning, but it is Minnesota. We are in the unfortunate position of being the most expensive state to start a business. So Mr. President, on that note, I would like to offer the A104 amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A-104 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Lucero moves to amend Senate file number 3035 as follows, page 60 after line 3, insert. This is the A-104 amendment. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I am a strong believer in full disclosure. And so what this amendment will do is at the end of this section, It'll add a legislative finding, and it reads as follows. The legislature intends Minnesota to be a state that is friendly to small business. That is our intent. That is our intent. However, the legislature regrets that Minnesota is the most expensive state in which to start a business. So, Mr. President, I would ask for a roll call. I would ask for a green vote because we want to be full disclosure, be transparent for any who would even think to possibly come to Minnesota, where we have high crime, the land of 10,000 taxes, where we have failing schools, where businesses are closing, where people are fleeing. Do not come to this Democrat-run state that is being destroyed. Please vote green. Roll call requested and granted. Any discussion on the amendment? Senator Frentz. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Lucero. I rise in opposition to the amendment, Mr. President, and I want to just address uh, some of the questions we have about what kind of state we're living in here. Mr. President, you know we have 17 Fortune 500 companies in Minnesota, second highest per capita in the country. Did you know that 19 other states required the ACT of their students? Do you know where Minnesota's scores rank, Mr. President, amongst those 19? Number one. Right now, Minnesota has record low unemployment. Minnesota has a record surplus, and do you know why, Mr. President? Because Minnesota companies reported an all-time highest aggregate corporate income. Meanwhile, Minnesotans themselves reported an all-time high personal and individual income. We didn't raise tax rates. They just made more money. I meant to mention to Senator Lucero off the record, but since I got the microphone, that the crime statistics down were compared year to year earlier. So the winter didn't play a role. Those stats were from the year before. 
And I have to add, Mr. President, as I've said on the floor before, the growth in our population for the last decade was 7.4% above the national average. We live in a great state. And before I give up the floor, Mr. President, let me just add the twins won four to three. So I ask you, isn't this a great state to live and work and raise a family in? Please vote no on the amendment. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Further discussion on the amendment? Secretary will take the roll on the amendment. Nope, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, again, I appreciate the remarks from my friend, Senator Friends. But let's go to one more headline, that is today. Well, of those Fortune 100 companies that he's talking about, look at this headline, Star Tribune. Best Buy lays off hundreds. Best Buy employee numbers have declined by approximately 25,000, or 20%. Mr. President, these Fortune 100, Fortune 500, and other businesses, we can't look to the past as the Democrat leadership is seeking to crush these businesses. They are crushing them with bills that haven't even come to the floor yet. And we'll have that conversation in a future day. But we can't rest on the laurels of the past. We can't rest on businesses like Medtronic that started in a garage or under the, of the many businesses across Minnesota that may not have reached the Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 status, but started decades ago in an era when there was less regulation, burdensome government mandates that allowed them to start and then grow. So a friendly business environment that allowed businesses to start and expand and then Democrats are seeking to crush those businesses with mandates that is going to cause them to lay off people, to leave the state, and have economic impacts that are not going to be good for anybody. And I will end with this, one last story. Mr. President, I went to the Carlson School of Management for my MBA and I graduated in 2010. So approximately 15 years ago, I was taking an entrepreneur class, and one of the visitors that came into the entrepreneur class that day was one of the founders of another Minnesota company, Fastenal. And among the com he was describing how he started, how he and his business partners, they started this company. They had big barrels of bolts and nuts and screws, and they had a two-level uh, building and it was so heavy he said the, the the floor was bowing and they had to go down below and put foundation jacks to hold up the floor but they would take these barrels of screws and they would put them into bags and sell them separately anyway one of the remarks that he said I've never forgotten and he said if we had to start the business today so this was roughly 15 years ago let alone today 15 years ago he remarked if we were starting the business today, it would not have been possible. And he was directly commenting on the burdensome government regulatory environment that was and is Minnesota 15 years ago, and that truth has only been compounded in the years since then and will exponentially increase even more under this and other bills. So again, Mr. President, in the sake of full disclosure, vote green on the A104 amendment. Thank Secretary you. Secretary will take the roll on the A104 amendment. <laughs> Senator Kunesh for members voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, Senator Dibble set, uh, votes no. Senator Dibble votes no. Leader Dietzik votes no. Senator Dietzik votes no. Senator Fate votes no. Senator Fate votes no. Senator Pa votes no. Senator Pa votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. 
Senator Putnam votes no. Senator Putnam votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Rest votes no. Uh, and Senator Her votes no. Senator Her votes no. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Barr votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Farnsworth votes aye. Senator Farnsworth votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Miller votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Weber votes aye. Senator Wiesenberg votes aye. Senator Wiesenberg votes aye. All members having voted with the All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 31 aye votes, 35 nay votes, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. Third reading. Senate File 3035, a bill for an act relating to state government, establishing a biennial budget for the Department of Employment and Economic Development, Explore Minnesota, Department of Labor and Industry, Workers' Compensation Court of Appeals, and Bureau of Mediation Services. Third reading. Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I'm excited to vote for this bill today because it has so many amazing things in it. For example, as a mother with small children, um, this and, and bills will be coming in the future and just helping with childcare, a huge help. Um, but I would like to speak to something that hasn't gotten attention yet for veterans who are unemployed, underemployed, people currently serving in the Guard Reserve, people coming off of active duty, um, hard hats to, or helmets to hard hats. It takes people that are, have served our country and puts them into construction careers, carpentry, electrical, plumbers, pipe fitters, a whole list. So not only has it helped over a thousand people who have served our country learn about these trades and get job skills, but it helps all of Minnesota because these are services that we all desperately need more of in our state. So I really appreciate Senator McEwen adding in this important nod to our military and this service that has helped so many people already. Thank you. Senator Umu Verbaten. Thank you, Mr. President. I am just incredibly proud of my colleagues on the Jobs and Labor Committees for developing such a thoughtful budget. Chair Champion and Vice Chair Mohammed, you have built the equity budget, and for far too long our communities of color have been left out um, of these budgets. These investments are really historic, and I'm so proud of the work that you've done. Chair McEwen, Vice Chair Hostchild, it's been an absolute joy to serve on the Labor Committee alongside you, where you have constantly centered working people. I just want to highlight two things in this bill. Um, thank you for including my prevailing wage uh, bill that ensures all projects in Minnesota that require prevailing wage rates have the same record-keeping requirements. When we include a prevailing wage standard, we really should verify that it's being met, and that's what that bill does. This bill also has uh, funding for apprenticeships. I love apprenticeships. And these, uh, this bill is going to fund those apprenticeship programs that are going to get more people of color and more women into the trades, which is so important. And labor is really excited about this bill as well. The building trades, the sheet metal workers, carpenters, uh, pipe trades, 49ers, iron workers, they're saying, yay, this bill targets equity in apprenticeships. And it's going to help pave the way to make sure Minnesota Minnesota has a robust and diverse workforce. We should be proud of this. I urge you all to vote yes. Senator Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. President, members, I, I wish I would have been able to get in before third reading, but wondering if Senator Champion would yield for a series of questions. Senator Champion will yield. Senator Driskowski. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Senator Champion, I'm reading the Promise Grant Program. Um, the establishment of the program, by the way, members, the Promise Grant uh, and Loan Program uh, 
spends in the biennium $100 million of money. Now, of course, that's $100 million that's not going to nursing homes. It's $100 million that's not going to group homes and many other shortcomings that are coming forward in the budget because Democrats are putting together a budget that wants to spend everything in areas that um, they never dreamed of until they got the trifecta here uh, this biennium. Um, thank you for uh, yielding, Senator Champion. I'm reading the establishment on line 6.19 through 6.23 of the bill. Um, so what it says is grants can be made to businesses and communities that have been adversely affected by structural racial discrimination, civil unrest, lack of access to capital, loss of population or an aging population, or lack of regional economic diversification. So Senator Champion, um, certainly the first two terms on there, I'm gonna ask you, and, and the rest of them, are there definitions for these terms in the bill? Senator Champion. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you uh, so much, uh, uh, Senator Jaskowski. Um, you know, Senator Jaskowski, th there are definitions not necessarily just in the bill, but in general. For an example, we usually know um, uh, that, that, uh, that small businesses are the backbone to our economy. We also know when there's a loss of population because we know that is a, a, a huge concern for greater Minnesota. Um, and so they are given their ordinary and specific definitions, uh, uh, Senator. Senator Daskowski. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, would Senator Champion continue to yield? Senator Champion will yield. Senator Daskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Champion, uh, that's not what I asked. I asked if there are definitions in the bill. What are the definition of these? Uh, you know, I could have a definition of them. You could. Any other member could. Somebody in the Department of Employment and Economic Development might have an idea of a definition. Uh, loss of population or an aging population. I'm guessing aging is probably happening in the bulk of our counties in the state. Um, loss of population in many of them around the periphery of the state. Uh, but uh, Structural racial discrimination, civil unrest. So, so, Senator Champion, is civil unrest, does that mean this money's going to Minneapolis? Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jaskowski, for your question. Uh, just so that we're clear, we were very intentional in this bill to make sure that we were looking out for all of Minnesota. And so some of the definitions there uh, are issues that various parts of our state are having, and we wanted to make sure that it was really clear that we were being intentional about supporting them. For an example, uh, you see money that goes to um, uh, the Minnesota uh, Initiative Foundation, which, which uh, helps in greater Minnesota. So there's six reasons that they support. So that, there's money going there. Is there money going to North Minneapolis? Absolutely. South Minneapolis? Absolutely. St. Paul? Absolutely. Why should they not? receives uh, resources for their small businesses. We should not penalize small businesses because we don't like a region. If you don't like Minneapolis, I understand you have a right to your opinion, but when we think in terms of small businesses and our small business owners, we want to give them as much support as possible. And by the way, Senator J Jaskowski, we understand that in rural Minnesota, they too have a challenge around childcare, so there's resources that's going there as well. Senator Eskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Well, it says civil unrest in the bill. And Senator Champion, I think, I think we would have been better off just saying Minneapolis if that was the intent, uh, instead of beating around the bush here, um, and just say Minneapolis. If you mean uh, rural Minnesota counties, say rural Minnesota counties. Structural racial discrimination, we still don't have a definition for that or any of the other factors that are in the bill. Mr. President, certainly not a very well-written bill. Uh, we see a lot more scrutiny to these types of uh, uh, conditions around a bill in, in many, uh, in, in a large number of the bills, a uh, large proportion of the bills that we comp bring forward, we certainly aren't seeing it in this bill. Um, if we go down, members, to line uh, 64.1 in the bill, um, there's preference given to the expenditures of this $100 million 
Uh, and it begins and says a priority be, shall be given to those businesses that have not received a grant under Main Street COVID-19 relief grant program or a loan from the Main Street Economic Revitalization Loan Program. And so then it also says priority may also be given to the developers. So priority may be also may also be given to projects that involve developers who are black, indigenous, or people of color, veterans, or women. That's what it says, Mr. President. So, members, um, I think we're seeing our structural racial discrimination on line 64.1 and 64.2 of the bill. If you're a white guy who's not a veteran, you're a developer, you're out of luck with this bill, Mr. President. That's what it says. And we are writing discrimination right into the bill with $100 million of the people's money. Mr. President, members, this is not one Minnesota. This is outright legislative discrimination written into this bill. Mr. President, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, Senator uh, Champion would yield again. Senator Champion will yield. Senator Deskowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Champion, have you read that part of the bill, 64.1 and 64.2? Senator Champion. Yes. Senator Deskowski. Would he continue to yield, Mr. President? Senator Champion will yield. Senator Deskowski. Thank you. So, thank you, Senator Champion. So, if you are a white guy who's not a veteran and you're a developer, how are you going to be part of this $100 million? How are you going to participate in this? How are you going to have an equal opportunity in this state that you and others have characterized this bill as providing? Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Jaskowski, for that question. Um, one of the things that I think is really important and what we really try to do with this bill is to look at how do we help our state in general? How do we do that? How do we be really specific and really strategic about it? There are some people who do a lot better in our state than others. We recognize that, and we recognize that there are reasons sometimes that one group does a little better. Doesn't mean we do anything to, to the exclusion of anyone else. Like our veterans, for an example. Because that's one of the groups that Senator Jaskowski, Mr. President, outlined. We know our veterans go and pay a, a, a service to us and they fight for this country. And then they come back and sometimes they have challenges re, getting reintegrated back into our society. Sometimes to the point where they don't have an opportunity to be employed or to even buy a home. This bill looks out for veterans. And guess what? It didn't say black veteran. It didn't say white veteran. It says veteran because they support our country. It also says women. We know that women are not treated equally when we think in terms of pay. Women are fighting that. We hear a lot of that around the Equal Rights Amendment. It doesn't mean that it, 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 it plays to just black women. It says women. Because we know that sometimes we, we need to be thoughtful and strategic. And if you're a white guy, sometimes you're doing pretty good. It doesn't mean we want you to do worse. We want you to prosper as well. So it's not to the exclusion of anyone. You don't see anything in this bill that says white men can't benefit. There's nothing in this bill that says that. And if you're reading that into the bill, that's because you want to use your spider-focused opportunity to look in the bill and see something that's just not there. This bill is about one Minnesota because we believe in one Minnesota. No matter where you live, no matter what your zip code is, you are still a Minnesotan. Senator Skowski. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Well, Senator Champion, um, systemic racial discrimination, that's what 
is included right there. And that's what you are apparently trying to, or at least stated in the bill, trying to eliminate. I don't know who wrote this provision, but it's right there in the bill on line 64.1. Priority may also be given to projects that include developers who are black, indigenous, or people of color, veterans, or women. Now, Senator Champion, members, Mr. President, this is saying that the loan recipients or the grant recipients in this $100 million are going to be provided oftentimes to developers. And if you are a white guy who's not a veteran and you're a developer, you're out of luck. The authors of the bill systemically racially discriminated against you in this provision and locked you out of the $100 million or access to participating in it. This is not, Mr. President, this is not members, this is not Senator Champion, how we should be legislating here in the state of Minnesota. This is not a one Minnesota. This is dividing Minnesotans and locking people out. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Driscoll. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, there are th a number of things in this jobs bill that I think are important and that I appreciate and I think will be helpful to our state. I'm just gonna go through a few of them briefly. The Biomade, $100 million for Biomade. I believe this appropriation is going to uh, drive economic growth in our state uh, in, in, in an environmentally friendly way. Um, I think it's, it's a great provision. I, I'm excited about that. As I am about the Chips and Science Act. These are things where Minnesota can excel. And I think it was good planning to support these initiatives. Now, these, this is money that um, can be coming to our state from the federal government. Uh, particularly, I want to thank uh, the chair, Chair Champion, for putting in Bridges to Healthcare. Uh, successful way to train uh, medical workers, uh, workers in our healthcare industries. Uh, the CETA, the uh, Community Economic Development Association grants are going to help our smallest of cities uh, participate in driving economic growth. The Center for Rural Policy and Development, one of the most re highly regarded uh, research uh, institutes looking at what is happening in our rural areas and what are some of the challenges and what are some of the opportunities. I'm glad to see that we are funding that. And we talked a lot about child care, and there's a number of child care provisions in this bill that will provide quality child care, that will help with the uh, child care settings. Uh, some of that is going through our MIFs, which has been very helpful. Uh, and also, I wanted to note the, um, the initiative foundations, the funding for our initiative foundations. I believe there's a number of pieces in here that are going to be helpful for uh, Minnesotans and also for the future. I appreciate the focus on our youth in things like um, SciTech and in our Boys and Girls Clubs. Uh, and one thing that has been highly successful and that we need more of, quite frankly, is the uh, Easter Seals um, Father Project. We need more fathers. We need more fathers engaged with their families. And the Father Project has been highly successful. I appreciate uh, the support for that. Summit Academy, again, a great uh, training. The uh, the uh, STEM fields, the competitive grants for youth in the STEM fields. We had this rotunda full of these kids the other day. I hope you got to see some of the great things that they're doing. Carts to careers. Uh, there are a number of things here that I could go on and on, but I will not. The, the SIM cells, the Centers for Independent Living, these are Im needed investments that are going to improve the lives of Minnesotans. And 
while there is so much more I could go on here and talk about what is so good in this jobs bill, it really pains me, members, that there is one vote in this bill here. It's the jobs bill, which I just talked about some of the things that are so wonderful in that jobs bill. And then there's the labor bill. And that labor bill is going to further close nursing homes. I've already talked to people who don't know what is going to happen to their loved one. It may be well intended, but the overregulation, the idea, just like with the Met Council, where the problem is the people who say we're going to do this are so far removed from the from where the funding comes from, they're not making good decisions. The OLA report, that was one of the things that came out of that. Well, this is the same problem that we are putting our nursing homes in. And I think it is ripe for even, even greater disaster in an industry and a field that is so important as people age and their final years on this earth should not be in a setting or worried about they're going to lose the setting they have because of decisions from this legislature. So I will not be able to support this bill, but I want to be very clear. I'm very thankful for the jobs portion of this bill. There's many good things in here, and it's too bad that it's been paired with such a deleterious a labor bill that's going to be extremely harmful for our state. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, our, my fair city here has been a topic of discussion a lot tonight uh, on this bill. And I'd uh, just like to set a few things straight, first of all, about that. Just so you know, Clay County, city of Moorhead, it is the fastest growing county outside of the Twin Cities Metro. If you've been in a committee where I've presented, you've probably heard me state that fact several times. And while the city to the west that we affectionately call West Moorhead has actually always been slightly larger uh, than Moorhead, and it is larger today. Yes, but Moorhead is at about 45 uh, thousand people currently and continues to grow. And while uh, some have referenced it as Cuba, certainly the uh, doorbell cam on my front yard where it is still covered with several inches of snow does not in any way, shape, or form uh, resemble the tropical island of Cuba. Despite that fact, we continue to grow. And uh, as for the uh, gentleman who made those disparaging marks about my fair city, about it being uh, Cuba, uh, I don't think that necessarily a Canadian TV star who lost $18 million in cryptocurrency is somebody that Minnesotans really want to pay a lot of attention to. Uh, and by the way, he is also on the payroll of North Dakota, so he is uh, speaking for, I guess, his employer. Uh, speaking of our neighbor to the west, uh, they have a labor shortage, much like us, their legislature has vetoed numbers of bills this year that would provide child care. Child care, which my local Chamber of Commerce, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, says is the number one workforce issue. This bill addresses that child care issue. So we're doing great things here in Minnesota. Maybe one of the reasons my county continues to grow. Also, uh, when you look at some of the other legislature, uh, legislation that's come out of our neighbor to the west, I feel pretty sure that we're going to pick up a few more residents uh, in Moorhead and Clay County uh, when they decide to move over, as they have done in the past already uh, with some of the legislation. Uh, fortunately, Minnesota, we're investing in child care, and we're doing it in this jobs bill, uh, so I'm very proud of that. I also want to point out, it's been pointed here before, uh, on some of the regional initiatives. That was one of the bills of mine that was in here. They continue to do tremendous work. The money, the one-time money we put into those regional initiatives comes back in droves as they invest in the economy. The payback on those is spectacular. So I thank you, Senator Champion, for putting that in the bill. Also want to thank Senator McEwen uh, for chairing the Labor Committee, which I was a part of. Senator Dornick, too, uh, for being a part of that as the lead. Uh, it was wonderful to work together with you and all the rest of the Labor Committee. So I am a green on this bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. The year was 1983. 
And here we are in this great state of Minnesota. And what we needed to do was to celebrate what Minnesota is and what Minnesota was about. And what we did is we gathered at the state capitol and we had this live bands and we had food and we had Minnesota artists. And what was created in 1983 was a thing called the Taste of Minnesota. And as a young musician, to look at to see who were the different acts that were coming to Minnesota, a lot of them were homegrown, Mr. President. A lot of them were nationally. We had over 18 times that the uh, Taste of Minnesota occurred. There was 101 different sets of musicians that played for the great state. And it was always wonderful. What Ron Maddox started in 1983 was a legacy. And unfortunately, that legacy went away. But it's really amazing that here we are in 2023, after we know that almost every event, you'd get over 200,000 people that would show up and listen to these bands. And I remember running Torps Music Center on Rice Street in the, in the 90s in running the shop, the drum shop, and coming over and listening to the bands and saying, this is something that's really important to Minnesota. Matter of fact, Mr. President, 1994 was a great moment in the history of music in Minnesota because there was quite a few musicians from this wonderful state that were nominated for Grammy Awards. And I'm not gonna tell you one of their names, but some of us know who they are. Matter of fact, we know them very well. And it's such an honor to be up here to say thank you to, uh, to the members of this Senate for bringing back the Taste of Minnesota. In downtown Minneapolis, what you're gonna see this coming up when it gets portrayed and the people that are involved in it that uh, Mike and Clayton had put together, you got folks that had run the Taste, the Twin Cities Jazz Fest, the Twin Cities Blues Fest. Folks like that are all gonna be involved in helping get this uh, peace going, which is an economic development source of what we need, is to turn the state back into what it was known as. Minnesota music and Minneapolis music shall be alive again. And it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see. Matter of fact, if my old band, Mr. President, gave me a call, I would probably um, exit out the door. I'm kidding, I wouldn't do that. But it's really important that this really is a revitalization of what Minnesota had for years, which was a spotlight on music and a spotlight on food. And so thank you, uh, Mr. President, and thank you, members, for voting on this bill. This is really an, an awesome bill, so thank you. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Mr. President, and I want to thank Senator Champion and Senator McEwen for uh, bringing a really good bill with a number of great pieces in it. Uh, I am very excited for many of them, including the pieces around child care and bridges to health care, both of which have been highlighted, so I won't go back to those. But another one I want to highlight and thank especially Senator McEwen for including in her bill is my provision around um, adult changing facilities in public buildings. And that's something probably most of us have not thought about, but for families with disabilities, uh, it is something that is really, really um, impactful in their lives. We, in committee, we heard really uh, powerful and, and um, impactful testimony from folks who deal with this in their daily lives, who right now, when they uh, need to be changed and they are in public, they often are laying on bathroom floors in public bathrooms or on counters or just not going out of their houses at all. And so th this is an issue of fairness and humanity and dignity. And so what we will be doing moving forward and having those facilities where they can, with dignity, be changed in, in bathrooms and do what they need to do um, is going to have a, a huge impact on, on thousands of Minnesotans' lives. So thank you. And I'm very excited to vote yes for this bill. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, first I'd like to thank Senator Champion for, uh, uh, well, I'd, I'd like to thank, thank Senator Champion for his leadership on the, on the Jobs Committee. Uh, it's been a pleasure to serve on that committee with, uh, with him. Uh, he and I have been working together uh, for the last uh, five years, and I think it's been a, a good partnership. I want to thank Senator Dreheim, uh, our, our ranking member, uh, for his work on the committee, I think his ability to uh, 
and, and his experience as a small business owner in the state for many, many decades brings an important perspective to the conversations that we're having here today. The Jobs Committee had a large target, but it falls short of moving us towards addressing the greatest need that I hear across the state, the biggest challenge that we have in our economy, the difficulty to find qualified people to take jobs. Every time I talk to almost any organization, the number one thing I hear is, boy, we're having a hard time finding people. Senator Pratt, can we start a fund to attract people to my profession? Can we do it for nurses? Can we do it for teachers? Can we do it for railroad workers? Can we do it for truckers? Can we do it? Everybody struggling for workforce. And I think we had a real opportunity to address that in this bill, and I just believe we fell a little bit short. I would like to highlight, though, one of the appropriations to Abijah's on the backside, and I want to thank Senator Champion for including that. Members, Abijah's on the backside is, an, is a pilot equine therapy program that will help first responders living with PTSD to get back into the workforce, either back into their first responder roles or back into the workforce in general. The studies behind this type of therapy have been amazingly effective. And I'm excited that we're going to be able to try that pilot here in Minnesota to see if it works. Because the relationship that we have with horses, and it's amazing, members, is that they almost act as a biofeedback mechanism for us. I want to acknowledge that Senator Champion was thoughtful in making sure that all areas of the state were considered in his bill. You know, I think back to when I was a kid, Minnesota was a leader in the world economy. Now, I'm, I'm sorry I talk a lot about economics. I'm an economics and finance guy. That's my perspective. We were a leader in the 60s and 70s. And, and you know, it was amazing because I saw the, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing to see how many Minnesota companies were involved in that effort. And while we still have some Fortune 500 companies here in the state, I think it's important to realize that we've lost a few as well. And we have a few that are struggling. When you look at the best places to do business, Minnesota typically rates high, but when you look at the cost of doing business and the business friendliness of the state, you find we're lacking. And so I'm concerned with parts of this bill that I'm afraid will continue to make us less competitive. Now, I'm sure somebody on the other side will accuse me of being fear-mongering. That's not the case, Mr. President. As I've heard some of my colleagues say, let's refocus this discussion. I've already explained the misuse of the Workforce Development Fund in this bill, where we are increasing workforce development spending 960 percent. Monies that were designed to put people to work, and we're going to be giving it to the Department of Labor for administrative functions. Hidden in this bill, under maintenance, which is supposed to be our inflationary Bump. There's a 40% increase in the amount of money that we take out of the work comp fund that we're clar classifying as maintenance of service. Mr. President, we have not seen 
a 40 percent increase in inflation. And yet, we are taking money from the work comp fund, which is meant to be helping workers who are injured on the job, helping to pay those claims. And we're doing accounting and, gimmicking and, and gimmicks, accounting gimmicks and shifts from funds that were originally used from the general fund to cover these expenses. And we're hiding them as maintenance of service. We're requiring new mandates, as Senator Dames and Dornick and Ucky and Dreheim have discussed, that will hurt our small businesses. They just don't make sense. I found Senator Ucky's dis description of his hardware store to really be a good example of how this one-size-fits-all mentality just does not work across the state. And I think what we forget sometimes in this beautiful building is that every mandate has a cost. I appreciate the labor chair's passion and desire to stand up for Minnesota working people. Regretfully, this bill fails to recognize that we should be balancing the rights and needs of labor and industry, as Senator Dornick said. We fail to recognize that it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship. Employers need employees, and employees need employers. This was a bill I had hoped to be able to vote for. Members, you all have a letter from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. They're not representing the big businesses. They're representing the main street, locally owned businesses in your community. And they list a number of concerns with this bill. And I found this to be a good summation of why I'll be voting no tonight. It says they support an approach that limits additional cost burdens and unnecessary mandates on employers who are doing their best to comply with existi the existing complement of state and federal workforce standards and to keep Minnesotans employed. But because these provisions are so overreaching, because these provisions fail to find that balance between employer and employee, Mr. Chair, I encourage a no vote. Members, we'll now go to a sequence of closing remarks, and it will be in this order, uh, Senator Mohammed, Senator McEwen, Senator Dreheim, and finally, Senator Champion. Senator Mohammed, uh, sorry, I missed Senator Dreheim. I'm uh, sorry, Dornick, uh, Senator Dornick. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, Senator Pratt kind of took part of my, my closing comments, but I'm going to still we'll double up a little bit. Um, but to, yeah, I too want to thank uh, the chairs, both uh, Senator McEwen, Senator Champion, for the bill that's before us. And I agree there is a lot of good, good things in here. Uh, but I talked about in the committee many times, I always said labor and industry. And because it takes both, as Senator Pratt was talking about, and I heard a member told me that uh, the former commissioner, uh, Commissioner Robertson, said uh, labor and industry, and her job was be the and. To bring those two together, to not take sides, but to be able to uh, hear the point, counterpoint, and uh, continue to to build those relationships, to sometimes heal those relationships, to not choose a side. And I kind of thought, you know, I'm a sports guy, I like sports, and uh, just, you know, when we go to watch a basketball and a football game or whatever, the people we don't want to see on the field, well, they're supposed to be invisible, are the referees, right? We don't like them blowing the whistle all the time, stopping the game, but they need to do that when there's a penalty or when there's a problem. And that's what we are as legislators. We watch, 
we look and we're looking for cheating in the marketplace or violation of safety, those things. And that's a really important job. But if we get and we're out there and we're penalizing one team or uh, stepping into the business of that, you know, the game, it's not the way we're supposed to, they're supposed to do it and not the way we're supposed to do it. So that was kind of, as I have been in the, I mean, I have a pretty diverse background of being on the farm. I was a dairy farmer. I mean, my, my dad was. And uh, then from there, I went to vocational school, uh, carpentry school, went to tech school, love the, the opportunities that carpentry has given me. That's my whole life, 40 years. Worked non-union, residential, went through the uh, apprenticeship program. I love the apprenticeship program. Uh, they've improved it so much uh, over the years. Just really appreciate the unions and, and the apprenticeship and actually the non-unions, they're not uh, as far ahead there as the, 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 the unions are. Uh, but then I've also been a small business owner for the last 13 years. And as you, it's just totally different. If you haven't been in business for yourself, you don't realize the price that's paid for these small businesses. And in Minnesota, I just looked up a few, few facts, 526,350 small businesses in the state of Minnesota. And what's a small business? The definition I, I, I said earlier was 500 employees or less, but most of them are much, much smaller than that. And then the other thing is from 20, and just to, how tough it is to start a business. Most businesses will fail in the first couple of years. And this is another fact I found, I uh, just looked quickly. From 2015 to 22, uh, I'm sorry, from 2015 to 2020, 45% of the businesses that were in that time are no longer in business. So it's hard to stay in business. And we think of the profits that they make and the, the uh, huge profits, you know, we say, you know, we need to, that's wrong. Um, well, it's most of the time it's the large businesses, the ones that actually the pandemic helped, that uh, the policies of the governor uh, hurt our small businesses, and many of those failed. But the big, large ones didn't. So what we're focusing on, what I'm trying to say is there's a difference. And that's partly with the, uh, one of the amendments I had um, was to kind of show the difference between a big business and a small business. And that was just in the, the meat and poultry butchering, you know, that, that avenue. But it's for all of them. So back to the starting of businesses and what I was talking about, the, the difference in what I learned, uh, it, it seems like it's easy to run a business, it's not. You know, the thing that goes into the business is the extra hours, the weekends, the paperwork, the stress, the sleepless nights, the debt, making payroll. For the people that work for me or others that are in business, those people are so very important to us, and especially when you have a small business, they're more than a friend. And the relationship you build with those employees, and it just hurts me, to, you know, when we have these, we pit these against each other. And now there are times when that is the case, but very, very seldom is that the case. Most businesses know and understand their most valuable asset is the worker. And as Senator Pratt talked about, without labor, business is nothing. Without business, labor doesn't have a job. So we try to navigate through the, uh, the committee and, and, you know, uh, I think we did a pretty good job, Senator McEwen, I can't turn and look at you, but um, I think we worked well together. Now, 
being that you're in the a majority, you got to, um, you know, your policies are there. But I know that we work together, and some of those things uh, are better because of the voice of the minority. And I appreciate that. And I think there's more things that we could have done. And I hope that there we continue. I don't know if I'll be on the conference committee or not, but I would like to. But I will close and let some others talk. But I guess my message is that uh, it's so important to be careful not to, as, as government, uh, to get in the way of the businesses or the labor, but to have them work together. And when there's problems, that we need to address those. And it's not our job to, uh, and this is a tough one, as you navigate through, as I was in the union, we had our union contracts, uh, and I appreciated my union brothers. Uh, and uh, well, in one of the committees, uh, we actually had the carpenters union came, and I was a member of the 1382 carpentry, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in Rochester. And uh, one of the old members that I worked with many years ago, she was, she was there, and uh, I got to chat with her a little bit. So that was pretty meaningful. And just that relationship that you have throughout the years in the union, and it's a, it's a, it was a great opportunity, and I really appreciate uh, all the involvement in that and what they taught me. Uh, the only reason I left is because I got laid off in 2009, uh, the bad economy. And uh, so business, labor, labor and industry, so very important that they need each other. So back to the bill, I appreciate, again, like a lot of things that are in here. I, what I don't like is I, I, I ran on one bill, one vote. I know that's a dream someday, maybe we can get back to that. Uh, the omnibus bill, especially putting two of them together makes it even more difficult because there's policies in there that I can't support. and. You know, some of these mandates are going to be hard on these businesses. And as you continue uh, with some of these other policies and not giving some breaks to these small businesses, uh, many of them will stop. I, I mean, I'm a small business owner. I, I know I wouldn't uh, participate in some of this. Like, you know what? Of course, I'm older, too. and I'm So be careful with some of the mandates that are coming. I do appreciate that you separated out the refinery bill, the warehouse bill, and they're going to stand on their own. And I know that those two uh, have been worked on, uh, and a lot of things have been adjusted, and, and uh, there's really close to peace in the valley, and I know the refinery bill, it's close. And uh, that's because the hard work of the, the author of the bill, of the unions helping, of uh, some of the the refineries, uh, Matt Lemke, uh, Marathon, and all the people just continuing to talk. And so that's so important. And so just in closing, I, I, the labor bill, I, I, I want to vote for it because I am a labor guy. But I believe that um, some of the mandates and regulations uh, will hurt business, and again, uh, I'm not pro-labor, well, actually, I'm, I'm pro-labor and I'm pro-business. Uh, so I, I will not be voting yes on this bill. I'm hoping that uh, maybe through conference committees some things can be changed. But I just want to uh, finish with just a, a thank you to all the members that I had to have the privilege of serving with on the, the, con or the Labor and Industry Committee. Senator McEwen, appreciate uh, the conversations we've had, the work we've done together. Uh, appreciate the staff, and I know how hard they worked getting the amendments, changing the, the delete-alls on the, on the fly, and just all the things that they did. Just really appreciate all the work that they did also. So with that, Mr. President, uh, thank you. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm really excited to vote for this bill tonight. This is a good bill, members. It's a bill that supports all of Minnesota. It supports everyone from every corner of our state, people from all backgrounds, women, veterans, seniors, people of color, indigenous Minnesotans, rural Minnesotans, urban communities. It supports workers, 
business. It's a good bill. Senator Champion talked a lot about um, the Promise Act. And this is a piece of legislation that I am also really, really excited about. After the murder of George Floyd and the civil unrest, there were a lot of people and businesses in my community that were hurting and are still hurting. Those folks were left behind in the initial recovery act, recovery. The Primus Act is a, life, is a lifeline for a lot of them. These aren't big businesses. They're small mom and pop shops right down Lake Street and they need our help. And today we're delivering for them with the Promise Act. One item that I'm really excited about in, this, in the jobs omnibus bill is the Office of New Americans. It can be really challenging to navigate government systems and resources as an immigrant. And I'll tell you that from an experience. And this will help those folks who are coming to our state. And I'm excited that we're able to deliver for them. I can't talk about the jobs bill without talking about the man who's been doing a lot of this work and how grateful I am for his leadership, Senator Champion. He has been so thoughtful about the way he's approached this and I have so much respect for the way he has worked with me and with members of our committee from both sides of the party. As Senator Housley mentioned earlier, this bill has a lot of Republican bills, almost all of them actually. And that's something to be proud of as members in this body, both sides. And that I think speaks to the leadership by a chair who is willing to put politics aside so that he can focus on delivering what's best for all Minnesotans. And on a personal level, I'm grateful as a new and a freshman senator to have been his vice chair, to have worked so close, closely with him and to the members of our committee. I hope that you'll see that this bill reflects all of Minnesota. And there might be some parts that you might not be okay with or you might not be happy about, and I've spoken a lot, a lot of with you about it. But if it includes your projects, if it includes projects that you brought forward with people from your own district and we heard from them and we were intentional in including it, lean in. We can continue working on it and take the vote. And as a wise member once said, it's a good bill. Vote for it. Senator McCune. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, members, for all of the discussion and debate today. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief uh, because I think we'll have uh, uh, opportunities to talk more about all of these issues. But um, I, I do just want to say that I, I am very thankful for Senator Champion for the jobs bill, for this wonderful bill. I'm very proud to vote for the jobs portion and um, to see all of the wonderful things that are in that bill. It makes me very proud makes me proud to be a Minnesotan, and it makes me proud to see this shift and change. And that is that when I entered the Senate two years ago, um, I saw what people talk about, uh, that the wheels of government serve the powerful, the wheels of government are geared toward serving the wealthy, that there is no shortage <laughs> of lobbyists and time and funding and money to serve the interests of the wealthy and powerful. This body has been part of that for too long. For too long. It's time that we switch gears. It's time that we have something closer to an equality. It has been unequal for way, way too long. So I'm very proud that we have a labor bill that was led by Minnesota workers. And I hope that we will make them proud. Members, uh, I ask for your support. Thank you. Senator Drehan. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, members. Uh, thank you, uh, Jobs Committee, Senator Nelson, Senator Housley, Senator Pratt, and myself and the minority side staff. Um, thank you for all your time and patience with us. Um, Senator Champion and, and uh, your team, thank you uh, for all your work. I, I won't repeat what's been said already uh, by Senator Pratt or Senator um, Dornick um, or Senator Nelson, but I, I just want to kind of talk about where we're at once again, $1.2 billion in a time of record low unemployment. We do not need to spend this right now. I think we all could agree we could have funded Senator Hoffman's committee a little bit and helped out those PCA workers in the nursing homes or funded daycares a little more. When I get out and travel the state, and according to Google, last year I drove 1.4 times around the earth. I get all over the state. I visit with people wherever I go. I hear two main things to attract businesses or attract employees to communities. It's daycare and housing. And you guys all know I'm a broken record on housing. Um, so I think we could have done more there. Um, you know, I, I think we have the cart before the horse a little bit here. Normally, when we work on a project, before we promote a project, we want to get our house in order. And here we are spending all this money before our house is in order. And what, what do I mean by that? Part of it is the crime. We have a lot of businesses, and we've heard testimony of a lot of businesses, spending tens of thousands of dollars every month protecting their workers, protecting their businesses. We could have spent some money on that. Um, border communities, we, we, we talked about that quite a bit, um, had, had some interesting votes on that. Um, like most of the bills we've seen this year, there's fee increases, there's transfers that I think most Minnesotans wouldn't agree with. We, we tried to talk about youth employment and uh, some in the, in the um, chamber referred to it as child labor. It's youth employment. It's one year away from being out on their own. Part of our job is to prepare our young people for the real world and see them on a pathway for success. For me, basic education, career path, home ownership. That should be the role of the state. And I think by exposing kids to different trades, if it's the healthcare trades, excuse me, the healthcare industry or the trades, uh, I think they're both very important. Um, instead, we're spending $1.2 billion mainly going to a lot of nonprofits without the checks and balances that I think Minnesotans have begged for after the continued corruption in some of our programs. And just because we put a paragraph in the bill referencing current statute, that is not checks and balances. And, and I'll, I'll end it there, Mr. President. I, I, I know it's really late, and I, I do appreciate uh, Senator Champion's um, efforts on this bill, but I urge a red vote. Thank you. Senator Champion. Yes. Mr. President, I was thinking that someone else was going to say something, but I'm happy to be in this moment uh, and to thank everyone. And I want to end where I started. I want to 
end by saying thank you to our majority leader, Senator Kerry Diesick, and thank you for all that she does and her leadership and her guidance. I'm thankful for all the people I've thanked already, but just let me quickly just say that this, that this the Senate Jobs and Economic Development Committee has developed a budget that will invest in working Minnesotans, advance racial equities, and position Minnesota as a leader in semiconductors, chips, and bio and industrial manufacturing. This, this budget reflects our commitment to build an economy that works for all Minnesotans. And a highlight is that by leveraging federal matching funds, this budget will return federal tax dollars back to Minnesota and ensure the strongest possible return on investments. These investments will create jobs, bolster our workforce, and ensure that every Minnesotan has an opportunity to succeed, regardless of race or zip code. We're thankful and we're grateful, and, and we know that as we invest in Minnesota, we will get a return on our investment, and our children and our children's children will benefit from the decisions we made today to meet the moment. Thank you to Senator McEwen for her work on the labor side. Thank you to our fiscal, uh, well, our finance chair and all the others. I, I'm sincerely grateful, and thank you for uh, for, for all the hard work. Vote green. The secretary will take the roll on final passage. Senator Kunish to report the votes of those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, uh, Senator Dibble votes aye. Senator Dibble votes aye. Leader Dietzik votes aye. Senator Dietzik votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Fateh votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Putnam votes aye. Senator Putnam votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Rest votes aye. And Senator Her votes aye. Senator Her votes aye. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Farnsworth votes no. Senator Farnsworth votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Miller votes no. Senator Weber votes no. Senator Weber votes no. And Senator Wiesenberg votes no. Senator Wiesenberg votes no. All members having voted with the desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 31 nays. They flipped back. The bill is passed and its title agreed to. I think they clicked oh, the wrong button. Yeah, and didn't go. Yes. Members, we will now go to the 13th right. order of business announcements of Senate interest. Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Senator Pratt from 12 noon to 1.55 p.m. Senator Rest from 12 noon to 12.15 p.m. Senator Westrom from 2.30 to 2.40 p.m. Senator Dames from 10.30 to 11 o'clock p.m. Senator Jasinski from 1.20 a.m. to the end. Senator McQuaid. Um, thank you, Mr. President. Members, today is Legislators' Day at the Minnesota Zoo. I hope you will come join us at 10 a.m. You have plenty of time to get some sleep and join us at the zoo to see some really cool things. We'll see you there. Senator Murphy. Yeah, I'll see you there. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, a special thanks to the people who work at the front desk, to the sergeants, and on Mondays we should make sure and thank the pages. With that, Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 17th at 12 noon. Senator Murphy moves that the Senate do now adjourn until Monday, April 7th at 12 noon. All those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. The Senate is adjourned. <laughs>